ali.nl. And the site for asking questions, it's just a one-click process, uh, will also appear every now and then in the image uh, on your screen. After the interview, I will pass your questions, at least some of them, to Jordi Albrecht and to Professor Fukuyama. You can send in questions whenever you like. Don't wait for us to invite to do, you so, to do so. After the interview and the questions, I will come back to you with some short closing remarks. Last year, on March 8th, John Adams and the Bali had the pleasure of welcoming Francis Fukuyama live in Amsterdam. Juri Albrecht was also the interviewer that evening, so we know we are in good hands. And actually, we knew that already. I will now give the floor to him, to Juri. Thank you very much, Tracy Metz. It's always a great pleasure working together with the John Adams Institute. And uh, it's wonderful to be introducing Professor Francis Fukuyama to you. Welcome to everybody at home. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts here in Amsterdam, the Bali. Um, Professor Francis Fukuyama is truly one of the most influential thinkers of our time, um, but I'm going to introduce him uh, a little bit for you. Uh, professor at the Center for Democracy Development at the Rule of Law at Stanford University in America, in the United States, the author of a large number of books, including the world uh, known uh, The End of History and the Last Man, 1992, which is an elaboration on an essay of 1989, The, last, uh, the End of History, but also the book Trust, 1996, um, in which uh, Professor Fukuyama explains that the most valuable commodity on earth uh, actually is trust, the most valuable commodity in any state is trust, because it's the, the commodity which uh, enables states to build wealth and build large organizations which are necessary in our world to bring wealth and stability. Um, but recently, uh, the event you just talked about, Tracy, recently uh, he published last year, actually uh, 2019, uh, Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, which tells a whole lot of uh, very, very interesting things about the politics of our time and the resurgence of the politics of identity and the importance of identity in politics. Um, it's been translated, actually, into Dutch, uh, uh, Identiteit, it's called, <laughs> by Atlas Contact. Uh, you can still buy it. It's, I think, one of the most interesting reads on what's happening to our global uh, political landscape. Um, you referred already on it uh, to, to it, Tracy. Uh, recently, Professor Fukuyama wrote an interesting article in The Atlantic um, in which he states that, indeed, uh, the response to the COVID um, uh, epidemic, pandemic, uh, uh, the success to the response is, uh, uh, lies in the trust the citizens have in their state. Um, we will be talking about that. Uh, welcome, warm welcome, uh, Professor Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama, it's great talking to you. Thank you for joining us uh, from Stanford Live. Um, maybe, maybe just to start off, uh, um, Francis Fukuyama, why is it that this trust is the most important thing in the response, in the successful response to uh, the pandemic? Uh, why would you say that, just briefly to start off? So, uh, Yuri, before I answer that question, I want to thank uh, the John Adams Institute, Tracy Metz, and you for having me. I, I'd much rather be in Amsterdam in person, but uh, I guess this will have to do in this period of uh, lockdown. So I think the reason that trust is important, I mean, it's important in general. Uh, it's important for the economy. It's important for politics. But I think at a moment when people are asked to do something quite difficult and and extraordinary, like stay at home for two months uh, and not go to restaurants and not socialize and not do all of the things that they are accustomed to doing, uh, you're not going to do that unless you get a lot of voluntary compliance. Now, if you're an authoritarian country, you can threaten people, you can put them in jail, you can use coercion, but that's actually not the most effective way of getting compliance. It's much better if people uh, follow instructions because you know they believe that uh, the government knows what it's doing and they want to keep their, themselves and their fellow citizens safe and so they do things voluntarily but that requires uh, actually believing in a number of things obviously you have to believe your government's legitimate but beyond that <clears throat> you have to believe that it has the requisite expertise uh, that it's making decisions based on some concept of public uh, interest and not simply narrow political uh, calculations. Uh, there has to be trust in fellow citizens because basically we're social animals and we imitate 
you know, what people around us are doing. So if you're going to a spring, ba uh, spring break beach party uh, because you see all your friends doing it, you know, you're not going to be obeying rules. Um, and so you have to have, you know, citizens that trust one another. So for all of those reasons, I think in a period of pandemic like the one we're experiencing, you know, that's why this is a very precious commodity. Yeah, that's 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 um, we we can follow that. Um, it's interesting what you're saying, um, among other things, that um, you can coerce uh, people into behavior, but that's not too effective. Um, um, dictators wouldn't agree with you, of course, but <laughs> but um, but um, it's it's better to do it voluntarily, yeah, to 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 understand what you're doing, to trust your government. Um, in that respect, um, uh, how would you look upon uh, the Chinese uh, 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 take on this? Because they, they, I mean, they locked down uh, whole regions, and I mean, they are an authoritarian uh, one-party system, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but it seems to have been quite effective. So that would, how well, would that fit in? In certain ways. So I, I, I was actually about to add that, you know, citizens have to trust the government, but the government also has to trust citizens. Mm -hmm because you know, it's citizens that have knowledge of what's actually happening on the ground uh, in their communities and neighborhoods and so forth. And that's where I think China has a really big problem because it basically doesn't trust its citizens. And so you know, we had the case of this doctor, uh, uh, Li Wenliang, who early on tried to blow the whistle on this spreading virus and he was you know, told to shut up and eventually you know, passed away. And I think this continues to be the case that the government, you know, in a sense, doesn't trust uh, certainly an independent media or citizen watchdogs or whistleblowers to actually reveal uh, instances of non-compliance uh, uh, and so forth, because they simply don't like to be not in control of everything that's going on in their society. So I think that's a big weakness of authoritarian governments. It's the lack of the government uh, uh, not having trust in their own people. Mm -hmm. But... Um um, that that would uh, apply for China. Um, 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 you just explained that, of course. But um, everybody seems to be um, um, uh, under the impression that the response of China to this crisis was very effective. Or would you say it was probably not? Or is that overestimate? Over, or, well, <clears throat> look, if you look in terms of the statistics of per capita deaths and infections and so forth, there is a problem with the statistics coming out of China. So right. a lot of people think they're understated, but even if they're not understated, I think that you still have, you know, fairly impressive performance in controlling the disease. However, if you look at neighboring South Korea, mm -hmm. a democratic country, they have even better statistics. You know, they have fewer infections. They were able to control the disease despite a big early uh, outbreak. Um, and they have done it through democratic means. And again, I think that reflects the fact that uh, it's not a repressive state, that the government can make use of information coming from civil society, from, uh, you know, from ordinary citizens. So yeah, I think that China did this, but it did it at a big uh, uh, cost in terms of you know, personal, uh, personal freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could have been a better performance if the trust had gone both in both directions. Oh, that's interesting. That's 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 the, 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 a very interesting point. It could have done better if it would have done different. Yeah, and but you're saying it doesn't. So um, uh, democratic states and authoritarian states uh, could perform both quite well. It's it, that's not a defining difference. It's a trust in their population both ways no. in the government and of, of the government in their populations. That's that's what counts. It may be yeah. it may be easier to understand this if you think about some contrary examples. So mm -hmm. I think among the worst performing countries in the world are Brazil under Jair Bolsonaro, this mm -hmm. populist president. Yep. And I'm sad to say, you know, my country, the United States. I mean, we now account for by far the largest number of deaths and infections uh, and so forth. And part of the problem in both of these countries is that citizens don't trust each other. You know, both of these countries are deeply polarized. Uh, and that's completely affected the response of both places. So in Brazil and in the United States, you have a president that really didn't want to believe that this was a serious crisis in the beginning, uh, didn't take steps to ramp up testing or to get prepared. And when and well, 
Bolsonaro hasn't admitted it even to this point. Trump did it very late, but now he is so, I think, worried about his own personal political fortunes that he's urging people to go back to work even when the conditions really aren't uh, right for it. And mm -hmm. people will follow that because he's got these very loyal uh, followers, but then other people are much more trusting in the public health experts. And so it means that we don't have a, you know, a unified response uh, to what is the single biggest um, public challenge to, you know, our health and well-being in my lifetime. Would you, would you say that um, um, the distrust between the two the bipartisanism in your country, in America, let's turn to America uh, uh, for a short while, and then maybe to Europe, because we're, we're Europeans, but um, would you say that the bipartisan distrust actually aggravates the crisis in America? Oh, by far. I mean, you see this right now, you know, for the last several weeks, we've been having these demonstrations in a number of states uh, against the shutdown. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, in Michigan, you know, a bunch of these lunatics walked into the state capitol with, you know, semi-automatic weapons and, you know, complaining about threats to their freedom. Uh, and, you know, this is this is not individually rational behavior because you go to a big rally with no social distancing. You know, you're actually putting yourself uh, in, in personal danger of getting the disease. But I think the kind of cultural identification uh, has gotten to the point where you don't actually think you know, rationally about things, you, you say, what's my team doing? And if my team is saying, oh, we got to get back to work, you know, the, the, the virus, the epidemic is a big fraud, it's way overstated, it's really not a serious issue, mm -hmm. then you're going to take certain actions. But if you believe an alternative set of facts, uh, then you're going to behave, you know, very differently. Um, that's bipartisan distrust, and it, it feeds it leads to irrational behavior of citizens, uh, even because they care more about being Democrat or Republican than uh, their own health or, their, or, or securing their own health. Um, you also said that um, it's been aggravated, the situation, the pandemic in America, because of the erosion of trust into institutions by the central government, by the president. Is that right? Well, you know, the United States has always had a problem with government. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most fundamental uh, uh, facts about American political culture is that citizens don't trust the government. They trust the p private sector, but they don't trust uh, the government. And that's been true since the founding of the republic. Yeah. Uh, but it's been exacerbated in recent years with the shift of the Republican Party to the right. Uh, this really began under Reagan, but it really accelerated with the rise of the Tea Party after Obama was elected, where the government is seen as a potential tyrant. Uh, you know, the reason that these guys are carrying around semi-automatic weapons is they think they're going to have to defend themselves against their government. You know, it's, it's, I think, a completely crazy, you know, way of looking at the world. But that, you know, is true of a certain part of the uh, American public. And that's led to this gradual erosion of state capacity, which I think is also really critical in dealing with a national uh, emergency. Uh, we haven't invested enough in our pub, in our civil service. We don't hire enough experts. And under this administration, the situation has actually deteriorated because, you know, we've gone through this whole series of events having to do with the, the Mueller investigation and the impeachment and so forth, where you have, you know, permanent civil servants that are simply stepping up and telling the truth about behaviors that they saw and they're being punished for it. Uh, and this has led to an emptying out of expertise and a politicization of many government agencies. And it includes the Centers for Disease Control. I mean, I used to use the, the CDC as an example of why it's important to have an expert, professional, permanent civil service. But it turns out that over the years, you know, the leadership of that has gradually gotten more and more politicized. People have been leaving positions there because if you don't please please your political masters, your career is not going to go anywhere. And I think we're now paying a, a price for that. Mm -hmm. If we turn to Europe, um, we see um, a very different approach uh, in the northern parts of Europe and the southern parts of Europe. Um, what's your What's your analysis of that? I mean, it, the lockdown is much, much more severe in the, in the 
countries bordering the Mediterranean than it is in the Scandinavian countries. It couldn't be more apart, actually. Um, they're both um, uh, um, um, members of the European Union, but their approach is totally different. What does that tell you about your um, hypothesis of, well, uh, actually your, your observation of trust in societies as a valuable <laughs> Well, yeah, it, I think it actually confirms the overall hypothesis mm -hmm. because one of the things that you have in Northern Europe, you know, in Germany, the Netherlands and Scandinavia is a much higher degree of social trust and social consensus, which has been reflected in, you know, the continuing dominance of the centrist parties in, in most of that part of, uh, of Europe. Mm -hmm. In Southern Europe, it's different because you've had a much higher degree of polarization. I mean, Spain has had multiple elections because they can't agree on what kind of government they want. Uh, France has been bitterly polarized with, you know, uh, not just a, a populist right, uh, the national rally, but also um, the, the Gilets jaunes movement. Italy is even worse. Uh, they've had a populist uh, government, uh, I mean, now temporarily out of power, but very, very big divisions between the north and the south of Italy that get reflected in every decision they make in national politics. And so I think it's that failure to have a, a, a kind of broader consensus that can be steered by the elites towards sensible policies that's really weakened the ability of Southern Europe to deal with, you know, with the current crisis. And it's gonna get worse. You know, I think that now the attention is gonna shift from public health issues to economic issues. You know, mm -hmm. who gets bailouts? and who gets public support and where does the money come from and where does it go to? And again, you know, the same divisions, I think, between North and South that we saw during the Euro crisis are coming back, you know, in an in a even more intense way. And now, actually, it's overlaid by an East-West split because that's also another big division that's opened up in Europe. The countries of Eastern Europe, a lot of them have been slipping backwards, frankly, into semi-authoritarian or maybe even outright authoritarian government, uh, you know, Hungary and Poland and, uh, and then would-be entrants into the EU like Serbia. So uh, all of these divisions, you know, I think are going to make decision-making in Europe much more difficult. You would, you would say that under the pressure of the pandemic, of the corona crisis, already existing cracks would widen. So the north-south divide and the east-west divide yeah, I mean, in, in the union. I, I, I think they, they already have been apparent. You know, you had this recent decision by the, the German Constitutional Court. Yes, uh, this week. That basically undermines the, uh, you know, the, the power of the ECB to essentially help uh, some of the weaker uh, members of the, of the euro. Yeah, uh, the European Central just, Bank, yeah, to help yeah. The, the southern members of the, of the union. Yes, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And... and um, if we, um, so if you, um, you stated recently in, because these, these, these are worrying developments, huh? and you could, you could also say, of course, that um, never waste a good crisis, uh, the European Union has um, always overcome the crisis, and if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, the Union actually tends to, 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 to change, the European Union, only under pressure of, uh, of, of, of sort of major crises. Um, it has a tendency to do that too. Um, how would you <laughs> look upon the chances of um, uh, uh, um, getting, you know, stronger out of this sort of um, a Corona crisis, the Union, the European Union, the chances? Well, of that? Uh, what doesn't kill you makes it stronger, but then sometimes it just kills you in the long run. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how far that aphorism goes. Sure. Uh, yeah. So there, you know, you can think of lots of positive scenarios that will come out of this because I think that, you know, this crisis, like other crises, reveals weaknesses in existing institutions and political arrangements that people are willing to let slide for long periods of time because there seems to be no urgency. And then crisis comes and then people realize they have to fix things. It's not just in Europe. I think that's true in the United States and many other countries. Uh, so, a lot of that will depend, I think, on how the economic part of this crisis plays out. Mm -hmm. uh, if things resolve themselves over the next few months and then the pandemic recedes and things begin to be, you know, get back to normal, then I think that you 
might say, well, it was a big scare, but it's really revealed these weaknesses and we really need to improve the decision-making capacity of Europe and you know, within each country of, of national governments. Uh, however, I think that the likelihood is that this is going to be much more prolonged. Uh, I think the experience right now of Asia indicates that it's really hard to stamp this thing out mm -hmm. uh, in the absence of a vaccine or you know some technological fix. A treatment, uh, yeah. And you know, I think the you know the the economist was talking about a ninety percent economy. It may actually be an eighty or a seventy percent economy, and if that sort of thing persists for a long period of time then you're gonna get all sorts of strange political backlash movements because you know, this kind of prolonged pain is gonna be much harder to endure. People just get tired of you know, living under these conditions that they wanna blame on somebody. Uh, and that I think you know, could lead to much more serious political consequences in terms of the strength of the overall uh, institution. And we just don't know what the future is gonna hold. So you, know, you can imagine both good scenarios and bad scenarios. Yes, because um, you, you, you just uh, uh, stated, yes, there could be um, many good consequences from it. You know, there could be positive um, uh, developments. But if I looked upon your facial expression, if I may say so, mm -hmm. you're doubtful of that, isn't it? You, you were, you're more yeah, worried, you're I, more I worried than on that. Balance, on balance, just giving the epidemiological characteristics of what we're going through, it looks like we're not going to get out of it quickly. Mm -hmm. And if we're not going to get out of it quickly, then, you know, I think you're going to face much more complicated and dangerous uh, uh, long-term consequences. Because um, um, I'm just thinking of a, a quote uh, I, I, I read you, I read in an interview you just recently gave, I think it was on a, on a, on a website, SubChina, where you stated, um, I worry both about global democracy and peace because we may be losing both of them. Um, that's a much more dire scenario. Um, how, I mean, that, this is really, really worrying. And I think it's extremely worrying <laughs> if it's uttered by the man who've been, you know, um, uh, uh, one of the most, influential writers on 1989 <laughs> who's been mm -hmm. <laughs> who's been very influential on uh, writing about the, the consequences of 2001 the, the 911 crisis so what's um, if this is uh, a partly or ho wholly your take i mean um, how come will peace and well look, <laughs> so um, my opinion is not going to affect anything in, in in the long run and and honestly you know we just don't know what what's going to happen but i would say that sure lots of reasons for worrying about global democracy mm -hmm. uh, because any kind of external shock like this and national emergency automatically creates incentives to strengthen executive authority and mm -hmm. what we've seen in many countries is executives that have authoritarian instincts use this opportunity to increase their power the most obvious case of this is Viktor Orban in Hungary who got yeah. his parliament to vote him emergency powers of course, the first thing he does with these new powers is to roll back transgender rights. That was obviously the most critical thing happening in Hungary at that moment. But, uh, but I don't think he's going to give them back. Uh, but it's not just that country, you know, that this has happened. And, and I think that one of the things that worries me is that we're not even aware of this happening in many countries because we're so preoccupied with our own domestic uh, crisis that we're just not paying attention to other parts of the world. But it's been going on, let's say, in Uganda, in El Salvador, in Turkmenistan, you know, many other places where um, authoritarian leaders are tightening the screws and uh, are unlikely to give back power once the immediate crisis uh, relents. And so that's something that I think everybody that's interested in uh, the future of democracy needs yes. to pay attention to. By the way, you know, so if you actually, this is a concrete suggestion I can give to a European audience. Yeah, please. Europe is, at, you know, so you're talking about possible good consequences. Yeah. Uh, one, of the th one of the failings, I think, of Europe has actually been to prevent Hungary's slide into authoritarian government. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a lot of, you know, political calculations within the European People's Party and the European Parliament about why the Germans in particular haven't been willing to, uh, you know, to pressure them more. 
But actually the crisis gives you a perfect opportunity to do that because there's going to be a lot of you know, funds that will be, avail be made available by the European Union to countries that are in trouble. And I just don't think that they should be given out unconditionally. And this is actually a great opportunity, you know, with a country like Hungary or like Poland, both of which have been backsliding in terms of democratic practice mm -hmm. to say, you know, you don't get a single euro until uh, you have fixed some of these problems in your own democratic institution. That's my little sermon. I'm not a European, so I can't, you know, but vote in European elections, but I mean, it, the, it is an opportunity. The eyes of the outsider actually are sometimes more important than uh, uh, than you know uh, our own eyes. So it's it's a very important uh, observation, I would say. Um, um, you would say, um, but uh, I, c I can see your point about uh, a democracy and the threat it, this uh, crisis brings to a liberal democracy and to global d democracy, um, because you didn't mention a Z or a Putin, but they both you know are liable to do the same thing as Viktor Orban did, of course, and actually Putin already did. Nobody really noticed, but he you know, managed to stay in power uh, uh, for another 10 years or something. Um, um, but you're saying world peace as well. World peace might be at stake for a prolonged crisis. Um, well, yeah. So the reason I think to worry about that uh, mm -hmm. really has to do more with the developing world. Uh, you know, People have been speculating for a long time that climate change was going to make a number of developing countries basically unsustainable, mm -hmm. uh, and that that was already beginning to drive conflict in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, and that that in turn drove the earlier refugee crisis. And I think that the epidemic has not even begun to play out in many parts of the developing world. Actually, in Africa, it's surprising that the numbers seem to be as low as they are. But yeah. That may simply be the result of poor statistics and record keeping on the parts of, of governments. But you know, given the conditions in many parts of the developing world, in the next two years, say, this could you know, evolve into a really monumental health crisis that then is going to drive uh, people to migrate, to move you know, to their neighboring countries, and then eventually to try to get out of you know, their regions altogether. And that will bring back, you know, potentially a migrant crisis like the one that happened in 2014, but potentially on a much larger scale. And so that, I think, would be the main worry about political instability leading to potential conflict that I, you know, that I could foresee right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that we're so preoccupied by our own crisis, our internal, I mean, our own national crisis that we won't That's right. look upon other places in the world uh, uh, deteriorating or um, uh, backsliding or, 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 or big famines or those sort of things. Um, you also said in the same interview, I, I, I read you saying um, uh, there are some big changes in global distribution of power that have been created by this crisis. Um, since you're an a good observer of international uh, um, uh, relations. There, you, you're saying it's very interesting, and you're saying there already have been some big changes. Um, wh wh where would we see them? Well, I think that the um, biggest shift is simply an acceleration of something that was underway uh, before the crisis, which right. is a shift of global power to Asia. Uh, obviously, this is the big story of the past generation, but because a number of Asian countries have tended to get this disease under control much more quickly than Europe or the United States, mm -hmm. uh, it means that they're going to start recovering economically earlier than Europe or the United States. Uh, and that in turn is going to drive, uh, you know, uh, the center of global economic activity, you know, further to that region. Now, the one unknown factor has to do with actually the relationship of the rest of the world to China. Because I think that, in my view, actually, this is a positive consequence of the crisis. Right. Many countries are now reassessing uh, the extra extraordinarily high level of dependence that they've developed on Chinese manufacturing. And I think that actually, because of the degree of globalization that had gone on uh, over the last 20 years, we had created a lot of fragility in the system that is now being exposed by uh, the epidemic. And I think that 
you know, corporations thinking about their supply chains are going to think very carefully about, you know, exactly where to locate them. Uh, I think previously it was simply driven by very ruthless considerations about efficiency, you know, that if you can squeeze a couple of cents out of, you know, a particular supply chain, you know, you're going to move it to a different uh, country. And I think that resilience is going to be, you know, more highly valued in a certain way. You know, and in a way, this began with Trump's trade war uh, already, because a lot of companies that were sourcing things in China began to move their factories out of China to other you know, parts of the developing world are bringing them home in some cases. And I think that the one aspect of a kind of future economic world that may develop is that China itself will, you know, in, in a sense, become the target of a lot of global anger and, uh, and other countries, you know, will begin to reduce uh, their dependence on China. So it cuts both ways, but overall, it does seem to me Asia uh, is going to do better uh, of all the parts of the world, and and therefore, you know, it, it's still going to be a pretty powerful or an increasingly powerful actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So it's it's and for reinforcing actually already existing um, uh, tendencies, the crisis in that right. respect. Um, I am looking for a closing uh, a question um, because we want to go to the audience as well. Um, um, obviously, if I look at the interviews you're giving and the articles you're writing at the moment, you're having a close look at what's happening in the world and this crisis. Are you preparing a new book? Is there? <laughs> are you working on uh, on a book, or is this just um, me hoping that we can invite you back to Amsterdam? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually, uh, I usually take a couple of years, you know, to think about things and. Uh, you know, the New York Times columnist Tom Friedman uh, yeah. a few weeks ago wrote a column saying that anybody that was writing a nonfiction book before this crisis hit has got to stop working on it and rethink the whole book because I do think that this is one of those monumental, you know, events uh, like 1989 or 2001 that, you know, is really going to change a lot in the nature of global politics. And that requires, I think, a little bit of patience as we you know, watch some of these trends uh, play themselves out. Uh, so short answer to your question is no, uh, but, uh, you know, like everybody else in the world, uh, I'm actually just hoping to get back to some semblance of a normal life at the present moment. Yeah, yeah. We agree, though, um, though we thank you very, very much for um, right in the middle of this crisis sharing your thoughts. Uh, that's wonderful. It's, it's very generous of you because... Um, as everybody know, um, events are evolving uh, rapidly. So uh, your willingness to share your observations and thoughts in the middle of this is really, really wonderful um, and courageous and is helping, I think, us a lot and the audience to understand what's happening in the world. So we, we thank you very much for uh, uh, doing that. Um, from By the way, just one comment. Yeah. Actually, I don't think it's courageous at all. Uh, I think that there's a lot of courage being exhibited by doctors and nurses and emergency workers and so forth. One of the things that worries me about the future actually is the yeah. fact that people like me who are professionals and largely in the service economy can actually carry out our lives on Zoom or you know, other software uh, forms of connectivity, but if you work with your hands and you actually have to be in a factory or in a meat processing facility or, you know, some other place, you don't really have that option. No. And I think that, you know, another thing to worry about is that I think the class divisions that were already, you know, producing some real political reverberations are going to get more intense as a result of this crisis, because some of us are actually going to be pretty much insulated from the impacts, but others are going to have to face it very, very directly. And so I actually count myself as you know, be quite fortunate in that respect uh, that I don't have to go into the office and you know, I don't have to take the risks that certain other people are, are being forced to. It's a very interesting observation as well, yes. Um, uh, you would say that it aggravates the already existing class division, which the globalization brought with it. Right. Um, so actually, um, uh, the 
the, 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 the more fortunate classes are, ret are retreating into cyberspace and the others need to keep working uh, in, on right. a daily basis right. with their hands. That's an, it's right. an important observation, I would say, yes. Um, um, yes, it's, it, it might even be one of the more, in the long run, uh, uh, important consequences of the crisis we're seeing now. Yeah. Um, uh, the division of um, uh, capital and labor again. <laughs> Uh, Marx wrote about these sort of important things more than 100 years ago, <laughs> more than 150 years ago. Um, um, uh, thank you very much. There, there was time for questions, people from the internet watching. Uh, Tracy, uh, you've been following uh, the conversation and the questions coming in. Indeed. Uh, and maybe you have a question or maybe you've already a question oh, from the audience. We have, <laughs> we have many already. Okay. Yeah, people are eager to uh, put questions to you, Professor Fukuyama. One of them um, was about the one of the possible positive aspects of the crisis that we suddenly see that we need to fix things. The question is, if there is so little trust, how will we ever get to a consensus on what needs to be fixed and how? Um, you know, I think that that's very specific to different countries and the level of trust, you know, in the United States or Italy is much lower than it is in, you know, the Netherlands or in you know, Denmark or Sweden. So um, I think that generally speaking, people have said that uh, you get back to a sense of common purpose and trust by some big external crisis that hits the country as a whole and people realize they're all in it together. Uh, and you would think that a pandemic would be a sufficiently big external crisis that it would produce that kind of result. But I think what we're seeing in you know, the US and other countries is it's actually just exacerbating the existing, uh, you know, internal crisis of trust. Uh, now, at a certain point, so this is this interesting cognitive issue that right now, I think people are drawing lessons based on their partisan affiliations more than actually processing real empirical information. At a certain point, the gap between what you want to believe and what's actually happening gets to be just so great that you know you have to finally admit that you know maybe I got to rethink some of my prior assumptions, and a lot of times that happens you know when you personally are affected by something that you dismissed as a you know as an important um, uh, issue. Uh, so it's possible that you know if this thing goes on like that 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 will that will happen. But right now we're living in this very strange world where people have alternative facts. Uh, I mean, again, this is much more true in the US than in the Netherlands, but uh, you know, depending on your political affiliations, you have simply different facts. How many deaths there have been, you know, what's the contagiousness of the disease, you know, there's no agreement about this sort of thing, just as there was no agreement about the facts of global warming prior to this. Uh, so we'll have to see, you know, how all of that plays out. Another question, uh, uh, the, the question is, should we understand trust as coinciding with national identities or as something supranational? And is that perhaps the reason why the World Health Organization is under attack? Um, well, trust exists at every single social level that imaginable, right? It exists between two friends. It exists in the family. It exists in a neighborhood, in a company, you know, and then all the way up to uh, nations and, uh, and, the, and the global level. The problem with the global level is that trust is a, it's not something that just in itself, you know, you have or you don't have. It's, it's the byproduct uh, of trustworthy behavior. And, you know, the, the more diversity and differences you have in a group uh, the less easy it is to cooperate and therefore to generate the kind of trust that's necessary to lubricate subsequent social interactions. And therefore, you know, at an international level, since you have big disagreements over the nature of government and over ideology and religion and, you know, ethnicity and all of these other things, uh, it's very hard to generate, uh, you know, trust at that level. Uh, I think that in Europe, it's a little bit even more complicated because between a global level and a national level, you've got you know, the European level. And 
you know, this is one of the things I argued in my book, Identity, that there had not been enough investment by European elites in creating a sense of European identity as opposed to German or Italian or French or, you know, member state level identities. Uh, to create this true post-national pan-European sense of solidarity. And we saw that, you know, in the Euro crisis uh, breakout, and we saw, uh, we see it now in current pandemic where, you know, members of rich Northern countries don't necessarily want to bail out, you know, poorer ones because they don't really trust the governments to spend the money properly and, and, uh, and so forth. And so I think that you have to worry about trust at all of those levels and the the way you build trust really depends on the level. But again, it, it, it really is based on kind of trustworthy behavior. And so it means behavioral changes, you know, for, for many of the actors. One of our, uh, the members of our audience uh, wonders whether the COVID crisis could be the spark in the American political gunpowder keg that causes a new American civil war. Coming back to your comment on the danger for uh, uh, for peace in the world. Uh, well, that's a, you know that's a worrisome possibility. Um, I think that one of the interesting things in the United States uh, up till this point is that although we're extremely polarized, there has been very little violence. You know, I lived through the 19 late 60s and 70s when there's terrorism and bombings and you know, police shooting demonstrators and things like that. And we've had almost none of that in this country, despite the bad feelings that people have for one another. I do think that there is the combustible material there. Uh, you know, you have all these people carrying automatic weapons to a demonstration and, you know, a gunshot goes off and all of a sudden you can end up with a lot of people dead and then that begins to escalate and so forth. But, uh, you know, actually, I don't think that that's likely. I think what's more likely is you're going to have an election in November and, you know, you may choose a completely different kind of government. Uh, and actually, this may be the opportunity for democracy working uh, the way it's supposed to. And actually, between those two scenarios, I think the latter one is much more likely than the, the former one. That's reassuring, at least. <laughs> Well, perhaps this is my opportunity to ask what you expect in November. Will we actually have an election? I've read the hypothesis that Trump will try to postpone the elections. Uh, and uh, what do you see happening? Well, I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that what's much more likely is something like what happened in the state of Wisconsin when it held its primary elections uh, a few weeks ago, where you still have a epidemic, people don't feel safe going to vote, and there isn't enough time to prepare mail-in ballots or some alternative uh, way of voting. And as a result, uh, people will start to contest the election results. Uh, if you have a lot of mail-in votes, for example, I don't think they're gonna be able to call the election on November 3rd. I think it's probably gonna take you know, several days until people really know what the results are, especially if it's a very close election. And that is like in 2000, you know, in Bush v. Gore, that, itself could lead to all sorts of, you know, bad feelings and litigation, uh, you know, between the Republicans and um, Democrats. And so I think actually facilitating uh, a, a really fair election is going to be a really big challenge. Uh, it'll be met by some states and I think other states it, it you know, won't be. And so that's something, you know, to, to worry about. But the question, uh, there's a further question, which is what will be the outcome of an election? And there, I think there's a lot of signs pointing to really big problems for, you know, for the Trump administration, because uh, voter turnout in all of the primaries up to this point for the Democrats has been extremely high. Uh, he got a little bit of a bump in popularity at the beginning of the crisis, but it's since, you know, come down. And I think that, you know, the biggest selling point that he had for getting reelected was the strength of the economy, which is now you know, vanished. And the management of the crisis itself, I think has been so bad that, you know, uh, I, I think he has not done himself any favors in, in the way he's handled things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could get, you know, you could get a pretty uh, strong turnout uh, of Democrats in November in a very different kind of election outcome. 
a member of our audience is already looking forward to a Biden administration and has a question uh, whether the a Biden administration will manage to recommit the U.S. to multilateralism, to trade, to climate, all the major issues. Oh, I think there's no question that that would happen under, uh, you know, a different administration. Um, the, the thing that you would have to worry about, however, is that the underlying polarization is not going to disappear, even if you have a big Democratic victory in November. Uh, and there's going to be a, you know, a third of the country that remains extremely loyal to Trump or to you know, his agenda. And that is not going to go away. And you know, it, it was a little bit like what Obama inherited when he took office in January of 2009. It was right after the worst part of the financial crisis. Unemployment was extremely high, and it was very hard to dig yourself uh, out of that hole. And, and you know, Biden administration would have a similar kind of problem. And every step that they take is going to be second guessed and criticized. You know, by uh, the, the partisans on the on the other side. So I don't think that you know even a, a fairly decisive election is going to change things all that quickly, but certainly on international affairs where the president really does have a lot of uh, power to change policy. I think that's going to go back to, you know, something much more internationalist than, than what we've seen in the last three and a half years. A question that goes uh, uh, perhaps back to your book, uh, The End of History, asking about your view on the concept of democracy in today's world, I assume with the emphasis on today. Does it exist, if it has ever? And should human relationships interactions be re-examined? Well, we won't solve that before quarter past nine. No. But perhaps uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, some uh, uh, sanguine words on the, the democracy's chances of survival. Well, I think, first of all, you have to break down democracy into its components. Uh, actually, what we have really is liberal democracy, uh, which is the uniting of two different types of institutions. So the democratic institutions are things like free and fair multi-party elections that uh, are procedures that try to make sure that the government's that are elected reflect the will of the largest you know, number of people possible. But then we have a completely separate set of institutions that are the liberal institutions that are things like constitutions and the rule of law, which are intended to limit the power of even democratically uh, elected governments so that they cannot violate the rights of citizens, so that uh, excessive power is not concentrated in an executive, uh, that there are checks and balances that uh, apply to uh, to state power. And I think democracy has never been in threat, even with the rise of all these populist governments. I mean, they're popularly elected. And so they actually like elections. Uh, the real threat has been to liberal government, uh, that is to say, to the rule of law and to constraints. And so in Hungary and Poland, <clears throat> you know, the first things that are attacked are all of the <clears throat> check and balance institutions. So an independent media uh, 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 and nonpartisan bureaucracy, the judiciary in both of those countries uh, has been a big object of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the ruling party trying to get control of judicial nominations to make sure that judges conform to the ideological outlook of the ruling party and so forth. And similarly in the United States, that's really what Trump has tried to do. He's attacked every American a political institution that has gotten in his way. So, you know, the bureaucracy is really a deep state trying to subvert his rule. Uh, the courts uh, are similarly, you know, dismissed. The press, the mainstream media is dis dismissed as enemies of the American people. His own Justice Department and FBI, when they start to try to investigate him or his family, are part of this big conspiracy. Uh, so this is a very common pattern among all populist uh, governments. So I think the threat, again, is really not to democracy as such, it's to liberalism and to the kind of openness that liberalism uh, tries to breed. And that's why you've seen this big increase in nationalist movements everywhere, including in a lot of established um, 
liberal democracies. What would be required to restore trust in the U.S. is one of the questions here. Simply electing a Democrat cannot be enough. What could he uh, and the uh, VP, she, do to bring the country together? No doubt one of the greatest challenges facing yeah. Biden. <laughs> so that's not an easy question to, uh, to answer. Uh, I think that, you know, the starting point has to be that any future leader actually has to really want to lead the whole country. Uh, and you're not going to be able to regain the trust of everybody, but, you know, there are certain symbolic acts and policies that you can undertake that, you know, will try to rebuild that. So, for example, one of the big problems really does have to do with working class people who have not benefited from globalization that feel vulnerable and so forth. And so, you know, you have to devise policies that will try to take care of them in some way. Uh, I think there's a lot of symbolic acts that are important. Uh, unfortunately, on both sides, you know, you've had this tendency to try to build your own base by mobilizing them through anger at the other side. And if you stop doing that, uh, you know, that might help a little bit in, in terms of, you know, kind of turning down the, uh, the volume. And then, like I said, at a certain point, reality begins to kick in. <laughs> I mean, I would have thought that this would have happened a long time ago, but, you know, it shows how deep the polarization is. But at a certain point, uh, certain things that you do just cease to make sense. I'll give you an analogy. And uh, the, the Great Depression started with the crash of the New York stock uh, market in October 1929. But the government kept pursuing these uh, then Republican policies of tight money and fiscal austerity uh, several years after that until you had a banking crisis in 1931 and then banking system collapsed and then unemployment skyrocketed to you know, 25%. And it took that long for people to realize, well, actually, maybe tight money is not the best solution to our problems. But that's like three, four years later. You know, and so sometimes it really does take a long time until the reality that you're in a very different kind of situation, you know, begins to really take hold. And so I think at some point, you know, reality does, you know, it, it's like a big two by four, you hit a donkey over the head. And if you hit him hard enough, you're going to get his attention. Uh, and up till now, you know, the financial crisis in 2008 was not enough of a shock the early phases of this crisis have not been enough, but at, at a certain point that, uh, you know, that actually may come. But that, that can take quite a while. I mean, um, you're, you're right. I mean, reality is a bummer. You know, it hits you over the head, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the long term. Um, just, I think today, the, uh, CNN published a poll, an opinion poll, where they said um, that 36 percent of the American voters uh, trust Trump to tell the truth on the COVID pandemic. <laughs> uh, although 45 percent of the Americans still approve of him as being president, which, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, there's, there's a big a gap between that. A lot of people don't trust him to tell the truth, but uh, they still agree with him as being president. Um, would you say that it's just, you know, it takes longer for reality to hit? Or would that point to the fact that maybe trust isn't that important anymore uh, in your political leader? Or could you, I mean, comment on this? I mean, amazing yeah. poll, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard to know. I mean, his support has always been different for different parts of the population. So mm -hmm. there are certain core supporters where they're, they're going to support him no matter what happens. Uh, and that's, I think, that 30 percent, you know, that still think he's doing a, a great job in a crisis. There are other people that came to support him because they like overall things that he was doing, like deregulation or tax cuts or appointing the right kind of conservative judges to the to the courts uh, who didn't actually think that he was a, you know, a great leader or figure, you know, that people ought to follow, but they said on balance, you know, I still think it's better than the alternative. And then there's a lot of people, frankly, that just don't like the Democrats and, you know, 
uh, I think that was a particular problem with Hillary Clinton because she wasn't just any Democrat. You know, she she pushed a lot of buttons for people that really triggered this very negative reaction. Uh, and so there's yet another group, you know, that they're voting because they dislike the other side so much and not so much because they like them. So I think that, you know, those different poll numbers kind of reflect those sorts of divisions in, in you know, the support for, for him. Interesting question here from uh, Gustav. In the U.S., uh, is COVID bringing Medicare uh, nearer for all? And would that be a way to restore trust in government? So again, this is a question about social learning and rationality. I think that, you know, rationally, uh, what this crisis revealed is the importance of the United States having some kind of system of universal uh, access to health care. Uh, as I think everybody is aware, the United States was the only rich country that did not have a government mandated system of universal health care until uh, 2010 when Obama's Affordable Care Act you know, was passed. And even that one didn't really cover everybody, but it got us much closer to that goal. Uh, and then, you know, as you're also aware, Republicans then spent the next four years, you know, relentless. In fact, I mean, that continues up to the present, uh, trying to uh, repeal Obamacare and to, you know, get rid of, you know, what I think was one of the great achievements of, uh, of that administration. Now, you would think that a public health crisis like the one that we're facing right now would uh, underline the, the need for universal care. Now, whether it's Medicare or some version of Obamacare, which still relies on private insurance and private providers, you know, that's still a, a matter that can be debated. I think there's actually reasons why it was more sensible to go with a private option uh, uh, than to try to, you know, have the government run the whole thing. But that's an argument, you know, that's a kind of second level argument, but certainly the argument for reinforcing the universal mandate and, and universal coverage is, is very powerful. Uh, but um, then you get this whole question of social rationality, because one of the things we've seen with the rise of the internet is that social learning is very hard to do when, you know, you've got an internet out there that where anyone can say anything. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, in, in, in a longer term perspective, most social learning is basically done by elites. You think about the Great Depression and the lessons we learned about monetary policy, right? Ordinary people really didn't learn those lessons. It was academics, it was bankers, it was people that really understood, you know, the causes of the depression. It was John Maynard Keynes and, you know, people up at that level. And that meant that by the time you got to the 2008 crisis, Ben Bernanke was the chairman of the Federal Reserve. He was a, actually a historian of the Great Depression. And fortunately, he understood what the, the real lessons of that story were. But you still had populists like Ron Paul that were running around saying, we need tight money, we need the gold standard, you know, uh, and, and, and so forth. And unfortunately, one of the things that's happened is that with the rise of the internet, you know, the elites have lost control over these narratives and anyone can basically say anything. So there's this anti-vaccination movement that's very powerful in the United States, in Italy and other parts of the world. Uh, and a lot of these people are now lining up to say, if there's a, if there's a COVID vaccine that's developed, I'm not gonna take it, you know, because this is part of a big, you know, government led plot, you know, to control our, our lives. Uh, so that's what I mean by social rationality, that social learning really historically has been the province of, of experts and, and elites. But with the decline of trust in elites uh, and the rise of populism, I think that becomes harder and harder to do. That's a very long winded way of answering your question is, yes, I believe we should learn this lesson, but whether we actually will or not, uh, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, vaccination, one of our uh, questions is, uh, I knew, okay. Um, do you see a reason to mistrust the strong emphasis on developing a vaccine by big pharma? 
or should we look uh, more to other developments? No, not particularly. I, I think that basically, you know, there's a lot of different labs all over the world that are working on different, you know, vaccines. I think big pharma has more resources and therefore they're able to do this a little bit more quickly and broadly than others. But I think that, um, you know, they will be under a lot of scrutiny if actually somebody does manage to uh, come up with a cure. And I'm not that worried that they're simply going to be able to exploit it, you know, for their own uh, purposes. Because I think in the middle of this kind of health emergency politically, that, you know, uh, no company is going to be able to get away with something like that. If Asia come back, coming back to the role of China, if Asia comes out first from the COVID-19 pandemic and gets its economy jump-started before the West does, what will the consequences be for uh, uh, global relations? Well, you know, as I said, it's going to continue this shift of the center of economic activity globally to uh, to Asia. Um, it's going to increase the prestige, you know, so if you ask the question, are democracies or autocracies doing better? Uh, I think as that quote that you had from my article in the Atlantic indicated, I don't think there's any correlation. Uh, I think there's some democracies that have done very well, you know, Taiwan, Germany, South Korea, some that have done very badly. And there's some authoritarian governments that have done well and others that have done badly. So that's not uh, the big issue. However, what people are looking at is not, you know, they're not comparative political scientists that are looking at a big sample of democracies and autocracies. They're looking at the US versus China. And right now that looks terrible for, for the United States. Uh, and I think that that's what people are paying attention to uh, because China and the U.S. are seeing as exemplars of their respective forms uh, of government. And so that's the kind of reputational damage that I worry about, that, you know, the China model will get uh, what in the end is an unfair uh, boost uh, as a result of its apparent success, you know, not in containing the virus initially, but in dealing with its, uh, uh, dealing with its aftermath. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, we're not at the end of that story yet, because I think that there's also a lot of anger around the world at China for the way that they've covered up information. And, you know, I think that even in Europe, uh, people can see that a lot of the Chinese aid is kind of a publicity stunt rather than, you know, something more long lasting. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that the short term reputational damage that democracy has suffered is necessarily going to translate into long-term damage. And do you see, uh, given this increasing uh, east-west polarization, do you think there's a role for Europe to come fill that power gap? Or are we standing on the side uh, looking on ineffectively? Well, so the first thing <laughs> is that I do not think that Europe can possibly take this view that, well, you've got the US on one side and China on the other side, they're both big superpowers and we're gonna be equally distant from both of them, right? That's just, in terms of fundamental European values, that's just impossible. One of them is a pretty brutal dictatorship that's put a million of its own citizens in concentration camps, that, you know, that uh, is militarizing the South China Sea that, you know, and on the other side, you've got a, you know, United States that right now has got a lot of problems politically, but because it's a democracy, uh, it can change its government and it can fix a lot of those problems and certainly is more likely to fix them in the short run much more quickly than, than China is. So I just don't think that Europe can say, oh, well, a plague on both your houses, we're going to somehow maneuver between the two of you. Uh, and that means that actually I think Europeans need to think seriously about their own uh, values. So, for example, just to take the Huawei controversy uh, as an example, uh, I think that just because the Trump administration has been pushing this line doesn't mean it's incorrect. I think any democratic country that allows Huawei to build 
its information infrastructure is crazy. It's crazy to allow them to do that. There is no such thing as a truly private Chinese company. By law, all of these private Chinese companies have to grant the government access you know, to data, to information, uh, if the government uh, demands it. And so you've got to worry that you know, if you've got Chinese infrastructure that's built by a company like Huawei in a future crisis, China some, suddenly decides to shut down your communications infrastructure. So the internet stops working. You know? Are you going to really allow yourself to be put in that kind of a situation? So again, I mean, that's a very concrete example where I just don't think that Europe has the luxury of pretending that it's somehow going to carve out this reasonable middle position between these two unreasonable you know, superpowers. I, I think that you have to take basic European values into consideration. And between those two powers, you know, it's not China that is really the, you know, the best example of them. Yuri, do you have any uh, closing question for uh, Professor Fukuyama? Well, um, um, I'm very uh, interested in the last uh, remark you made. Um, we cannot just uh, sit on the fence uh, between two big powers. We, we need to reevaluate our own values and 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 uh, see whether we are Democrats or not, whether we're interested in um, authoritarian government or not. <laughs> and I would say that probably uh, you know the large majority of the Europeans would immediately you know choose democracy for that. Um, but coming back to the introduction of our con the first part of our conversation, you're saying, um, interesting enough, whether you're an authoritarian or a democratic government, it doesn't really make, that's not the divide, not, not the most, um, uh, that's not what defining your effectiveness towards this uh, pandemic. Um, so in that light, why would you want, I mean, if there isn't any difference between those two, uh, maybe to, 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 to rounded off this conversation, what would be the reason, if, if there isn't any difference in the response, in the effect, effective response towards yeah. a, a pandemic, why would we choose for a democratic? Yeah, well, I mean, precisely, <laughs> right? So the exactly wrong lesson to draw from this crisis is to say, oh, we need authoritarian government. You know, we need to move closer to the Chinese model. It's not mm -hmm. true. I think what you need to do is move closer to the South Korean model. You know, you remain a democracy, but you have good state capacity. Uh, you have good social consensus where people will trust the government. And that's what will lead to, you know, effective uh, outcomes. It's not by, you know, being able to arrest people and, you know, control the media environment and this sort of thing that you're going to get to uh, to positive results. And so I think that's a really important lesson that people need to take away. Being a democracy does not guarantee that you're going to do well, but you know it sure isn't the case that being an authoritarian government uh, that doesn't guarantee good results either. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You're going to round off, Tra Tracy. I'll Th round off. Thank you very much again, Professor Fukuyama. Thank you. Thank you, thank audience. You very much. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Yuri and the Bali. And thank you to our, uh, for us, invisible audience for joining us this evening. Uh, on May 26th, the John Adams will be doing an online interview with Esther Suffren Four, indeed the mother of Joshua, Jonathan, and Franklin, about her new book, I Want You to Know We're Still Here, a, a, a memoir. And on June 20th, we are welcoming another returning luminary in the field of international relations, Madeleine Albright. Make sure you check out the lively online programming of the Bali as well on their website. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. I gotta go to another meeting, so I'm gonna log off. <laughs>